truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Now, friends, these books are free. Paid for by real Americans who want others to know the truth. Excuse me, young man, but are you actually going to read that stuff? Sure, why not? You heard what he said. Didn't you? Yes, I heard. Do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. Makes pretty good sense to me. I'm speaking to you as an American American. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know Masons. What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Before he said Masons, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people, all of us. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. There's a burning in the air and a sense to the people that everything had changed. Onlookers were surrounded by broken glass in the burning hall. The seat of democratic power in the nation was in flames. The people were scared and worried, and with this chaos going on, an opportunity arose for the far right-wing coalition. The Nazis had long despised the left, having harshly criticized the welfare state, believing that only the quote, strong should survive and wanted to do anything in their power to stop them from upsetting the capitalist status quo of what appeared to be a dying and decaying state. The fire's onlookers were gazing into the death throes of democracy. This may sound like a modern event, but I am talking about the burning of the Reichstag. A member of the Dutch Council Communist Party, Marinus van der Lubbe, was found by broken glass, sweating with a lighter, out behind the Reichstag. Hitler, upon hearing about the prime suspect, turned to Franz von Papen, his vice chancellor, who was the one who originally recommended to President von Hindenburg, along with 22 industry executives, that he be appointed to the supposedly almost ceremonial post of chancellor in order to attempt to keep him under control, and said that, This is a God-given signal. Hitler continued that, if this fire, as I believe, is the work of communists, then we must crush out this murderous pest with an iron fist. The Communist Party was the third biggest party in Germany, with the current government being controlled by the minority party, the Social Democrats. And up until the fire, the Nazis were hemorrhaging political support with the people, losing 34 seats in the previous election. Six days after the fire, new elections were held, dissolving the current Reichstag, which under the new temporary head of the Reichstag, the Nazi party's President Hermann Göring, allowed Hitler's storm up to long paramilitary forces, aka SA or brown shirts, to commit a campaign of terror. A day after the fire, the German far-right coalition passed the Reichstag fire decree, suspending all civil liberties, and was used as a legal basis for the imprisonment of anyone who was considered a threat to the Nazis. They didn't outright ban the communists, but they imprisoned 4,000 of their members including party leader Ernst Thalmann. The unsympathetic courts and prosecutors threw the book at them, giving them life in jail, 20 years of hard labor, or in some cases, even death. This was the death of German democracy, and the moment when the country went down an irreversible path, where the far right refused the basis of democratic elections which they had lost favor in, and out of desperation, used a political moment in voter suppression to seize power and force another election. 
two weeks after the election, Hitler was able to pass the Enabling Act on the 23rd of March, with the support of all the non-socialist parties, which effectively gave Hitler dictatorial powers. Within months, the Nazis banned all other parties, and turned the Reichstag into a rubber stamp legislature, comprising of only Nazis and pro-Nazi guests. In 1942, Hermann Göring later said during a luncheon on Hitler's birthday, The only one who really knows about the Reichstag is I, because I set it on fire. Many historians believe the fire was not started by Marinus, but was started by the Nazis themselves. And while it's still an ongoing debate to this day, one thing is certain. The Nazis used this opportunity to blame this on a massive supposed communist conspiracy they saw as meant to destroy Germany, and used it to seize power. This was the death of a democracy, and the rise of the fascists. research for this video, I've seen all different types of definitions for what fascism is, and what countries historically constitute fascist governments. Many different scholars have completely different definitions of fascism, which leads to people having completely different beliefs on the subject, and given the wide range of definitions, it is necessary to pick the framework that I personally believe is the most accurate. But I also must acknowledge scholars like A. James Greger, a professor at UC Berkeley, who believe fascism originated as a very variant of Marxism, and denied that right-wing extremism was fascism, saying, Fascism was a variant of classical Marxism, a belief system that pressed some themes both argued by Marx and Engels until they found expression in the form of national syndicalism. That was to animate the first fascism. And while I personally disagree with him, I would be doing you guys a disservice if I wasn't presenting that viewpoint to you. Other scholars like Roger Griffin, a historian and political scientist, believes fascism is populist rhetoric that argues for a rebirth of a conflated nation and ethnic people. Or to put it simply, fascism argues for the rebirth of a nation to form a mixed national identity based upon culture and race. Given the previous examples, I find it only fair to tell you what school of thought I follow, given this video covers just that, <laughs> backed up with the evidence to prove my point. My personal framework follows the beliefs of scholars and activists like Claire Zetkin, a German Marxist theorist, activist and advocate for women's rights, or Grigory Dimitrov, a theorist of capitalism and a Bulgarian politician, who believe that fascism is a reaction to other political movements, especially that of Marxism, and that it is a last ditch attempt by the ruling class to maintain their wealth and status. Now I can acknowledge that fascism takes a syndicalist organization of Marxism, but it also mixes it with far right-wing political views, which is supported by the works of Professor Roderick Stackelberg. Fascist groups saw the popularity of socialist groups, so they convinced the working people that they were on their side, while also appealing to the industrialists by convincing them that they weren't actually going to pass any actual programs that helped redistribute the wealth to the common people, diverting the justified anger the working class had of the rich onto a scapegoat such as Jews in Germany, or immigrants in communists in Italy, and seizing these scapegoats' wealth, hurting innocent everyday people, which just makes fascism a tool for the bourgeoisie. The thing is, fascism doesn't upset the establishment status quo. This is why groups like the Nazis were heavily funded by the bourgeoisie and aligned themselves with the conservative parties to come to power. And while of course you are free to have your own beliefs and may disagree with mine, one thing is crystal clear on the definition of fascism. It is vague and varied. And from my point of view, the best way to explain what fascism is, is to look at what previous fascist governments had in common, and what qualities make up a fascist dictatorship. And the best source that I can think of to help with that is the philosopher Umberto Eco, who actually grew up in fascist Italy which is of course the nation originally responsible for modern fascism, and to describe his work Er Fascism, meaning eternal fascism, and its 14 points of what makes up a fascist movement. But as Umberto Eco once said about the idea of fascism being a single school of thought, Fascism cannot be organized into a system. 
Many of them contradict each other and are also typical of other kinds of despotism or fanaticism, but it is enough that one of them be present to allow fascism to coagulate around it. Number one, the cult of tradition. One has only to look at the syllabus of every fascist movement to find the major traditionalist thinkers. The Nazi gnosis was nourished by traditionalist, syncretistic, occult elements. The Nazis believed in a romanticized German history originating in the Volksmovement, which was interested in historical narratives that bolstered the idea of an Aryan German nation-state, which believed in an Aryan Viking past of only Aryan people in Germany. Despite the fact that actual Viking history was multicultural, Vikings intermarried with the people in the lands they conquered and visited, such as the Celts, Inuit, and Turks. Not to mention the fact that a Viking was traditionally a Scandinavian pirate during the Middle Ages. So during raids, the Vikings would pick up anyone who wanted to join them, thus making them a Viking themselves. Which allowed a bunch of Slavs, Celts, and other groups to become Vikings that the Nazis would not have been fans of. These German scholars during the Third Reich, such as Gustav Neckel and Bernard Kummer, blamed socialism, Jews, and class revolutions for the supposed decline of a Germanic race they saw descending from this falsified Viking past. Many fascist movements have this same corrupted view of history, in which they have idealized a falsified moment of their supposed people's history that completely disassociates and goes against the actual history of their people. Number 2. The Rejection of Modernism the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, is seen as the beginning of modern depravity. In this sense, Ur fascism can be defined as a rationalism. You can see this point with many fascist movements that call it art, especially modern art, depraved and degenerate. You can see it both modern day and in the past, with the terms cultural Marxists and Bolsheviks being used to denounce modernists and progressive movements in their works. The Nazis themselves had a museum filled with art they called degenerate that they believed were un-German, Jewish, or communist in nature, filled with 650 modernist works from state-owned museums. And in a society that is supposed to despise and be disgusted by these works, you would think they would try to destroy them, or at the least try to hide them away from the people. But no, the art was seen by the people. It needed to be seen, so it could anger the populace and inflame public opinion against modernism. Fascists don't just despise the works of progressives, modernists, and postmodernists, but they want to erase it and replace it with their own new modernist ideals based on their beliefs, not the current art that they see as a corruption of their culture and a corruption of their framework. They showed these pieces so they could enrage their followers, that were told to hate these works to keep them enraged, which is why they kept a limited amount of these works and displayed them prominently. You see people talking about Nazi super weapons and assume the Nazis praised technology, but that was merely surface level. Their beliefs led them to believe that the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason was the origins of modern depravity, and that we must go back to the philosophical dark age before then, thus making fascism reactionary by nature. Number 3. The Cult of Action for Action's Sake Action, being beautiful in itself, it must be taken before or without any previous reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation. Having a distrust of the intellectual world is ingrained in fascist beliefs. The hatred by the right of universities may seem like a new thing, but almost all fascist movements have seen universities as the nests of reds. The reasoning is because universities foster critical thinking and reasoning. And in fascist states, you cannot disagree with the party's message. So action must be taken against them. Because any form of disagreement with the party must be met with action and violence. Fascist states despise critical thinking and the education required to foster it. Number four, disagreement is treason. The critical spirit makes distinctions, and to distinguish is a sign of modernism. In modern culture, the scientific community praises disagreement as a way to improve knowledge. Modern science and reasoning are used in order to understand objective truth. You must test your hypothesis according to the scientific method, and then let your peers review your methodology. This is a symptom of modernism in the Enlightenment. When your ideology revolves around appeals to emotion rather than facts, you must be opposed to critical thinking and opposing viewpoints. Because of this, any disagreement with the party's appeals to emotion, especially on factual ground, is met with the harshest resistance by fascist groups. Number 5. The Fear of Difference the first appeal of a fascist or prematurely fascist movement is an appeal against the intruders. Thus, Ur-Fascism is racist by definition. 
During Mussolini's rise to power, he implemented racial laws, which promoted explicit racial discrimination. The government, in cooperation with the church, stated that hybrid unions, meaning interracial marriages, had to be forbidden due to the wise hygienic and socially moral reasons intended by the state and the inconvenience of marriage between a white and a negro. This was implemented so Ethiopians and other Africans in particular did not marry Italians. The reason why this happens is because of the hyper-nationalism and fascism Fascism forces a false dichotomy of us versus them, may that be a racial one or a cultural one, that leads to a hatred for the other, an event to point the people's anger at, saying they caused this, it's the immigrants or the Jews' fault. This is why extreme immigration restrictions happened under Mussolini. Number 6. Appeal to Social Frustration one of the most typical features of the historical fascism was the appeal to a frustrated middle class, a class suffering from an economic crisis or feelings of political humiliation, and frightened by the pressure of lower social groups. Fascism appeals to the angry and the scared. It appeals to the middle and lower classes with little education, scared of possibly losing what little prestige they have, and appeals to the elites as a way to save them from the masses rising up and trying to gain their fair share of the wealth. Fascism along with other ideologies become more popular during times of social and economic turmoil, especially when groups believed that they were owed something, but were stabbed in the back like the Germans post-World War I, who believed that Jews and communists stopped them from winning the war. The middle class is convinced that the lower classes are coming for them in the hierarchy, not the elites exploiting them, and will do anything in their power to prevent the rise of a socialist revolution, under fear of losing what little status they have. In this aspect, they are convinced by the true elites that they themselves are part of this elite class. And for that reason, fascism appeals to cultural or racial solidarity with each other, instead of the true division of people, which is class. A poor white man has much more in common with a poor black man than a rich white man. Because of this, the rich divide the people on this made-up ethnic and cultural solidarity, while the true elites, the rich, have all the wealth. For this reason, business elites will support fascist movements to gain profits out of fear of a socialist revolution, knowing fascists won't care if you exploit labor and make money, as long as you agree with the party. Look no further than Henry Ford, the founder of Ford with the Nazis, or Francisco Franco in Spain, opening up the economy to economic cooperation while maintaining the fascist Franco ideals. Number 7. The Obsession with the Plot The followers must feel besieged. The easiest way to solve the plot is the appeal to xenophobia. The followers of a fascist belief must believe that there is someone out to get them, whether that be Jews, immigrants, or any other group of people that are vilified. And if they don't stand up to stop them, then their culture or way of life will be destroyed. This can start out as a cultural nationalism, but if not careful, it can easily evolve into an ethnic nationalism. For this reason, fascism is inherently opposed to both progressivism and multiculturalism believing that accepting other people with different cultures will lead to the destruction of their own culture, leading them to feel under attack, which fosters a culture of xenophobia in fascist groups that only the leader of the group can solve. Number 8. The enemy is both strong and weak. By a continuous shifting of rhetorical focus, the enemies are at the same time too strong and too weak. You only have to look so far at the German view of Jews to understand that they believed that Jewish people were inferior to Germans. But at the same time to them, they somehow controlled the world. You can even see this fascist thought incorporated in the West today. In the US, for instance, Hispanic people are commonly categorized by the right as lazy drains on the country's economy, while at the same time being workaholics that are supposedly coming for your job. This clearly shows the rhetoric of the enemy being both strong and weak. Number 9. Pacifism is trafficking with the enemy. For Ur fascism, there is no struggle for life, but rather, life is lived for struggle. Fascism is based on creating soldiers and having the entire populace trained for war, the men to die, while the women create more men. Human life in fascism is nothing more than a tool to be used. But because of this, there can be no peace, and even when the enemy is beaten, there must be another enemy to face. Fascism is a snake that eats itself. If the Germans, Italians, and Japanese won World War II, then they would have turned on each other, because there can be no peace unless the world is controlled by the party. And even if the world is controlled, there still needs to be an enemy to justify the continued existence of the state. In neo-Nazi groups, Jewish people are obviously not allowed to join. But if these groups ever came to power, Jewish people would be genocided, 
and then they'd move on to the next supposed threat they saw. Say, Irish people who were previously seen as white, but are no longer seen as that because the fascists need a new enemy. Then once the Irish are gone, next all Catholics would be killed, and so on and so forth. Because there is no such thing as a pure race, and the fascists thought there is only impurities in others, and these others are a threat that needs to be destroyed, hence the snake that eats itself. Number 10. Contempt for the Weak Elitism is a typical aspect of any reactionary ideology. Given that fascism is inherently hierarchical, there must be an elite and a people lower on the hierarchy. It maintains this pyramid by having the people in every section despise the people below them, out of fear of losing their status. It keeps the people complacent out of fear that the people will lose what little status they already have. The state is organized in a military model. This militaristic elitism can be seen in Nazi Germany as the rebirth of the old Prussian militaristic elitism that died down after World War I. After the people were disillusioned with the government and the Kaiser, the Nazi party remade this idea of Prussian militarism, which is why they originally allied with the old Prussian aristocratic militarist guard. The Nazis rise to power was also characterized with their hatred of the welfare state of the Weimar Republic, as previously stated, leading to a strong contempt to those considered weak and inferior. Number 11. Everyone is educated to become a hero. In Ur fascist ideology, heroism is the norm. This cult of heroism is strictly linked with the cult of death. With Mussolini once saying, The function of a citizen and a soldier are inseparable. This clearly shows the idea that the purpose of a citizen in a fascist government is to die for their country, to be used as a sacrifice, and that the only way they could gain supposed greatness is by sacrificing themselves. You must be a hero for the state. You must die for the state. Fascism is a cult that is centered around death due to this indoctrination. Number 12. Machismo and Weaponry Machismo implies both disdain for women and intolerance and condemnation of non-standard sexual habits from chastity to homosexuality. Since a fascist society is based on permanent warfare and a society where everyone must be a hero and die for the state, based on militaristic hierarchy, fascists will try to exercise their will on sexual matters. This is the origin of machismo, and since sex is such a rigid definition only seen as a power struggle to the ur fascist, the ur fascist hero will compensate for sex with weapons, following this same power struggle. Number 13. Selective Populism there is in our future a TV or internet populism in which the emotional response of a selected group of citizens can be presented and accepted as the voice of the people. This point is actually a bit of foreshadowing by Umberto Eco, since he wrote this essay in 1995 and he already predicted modern day internet populism. Modern day groups like QAnon who espouse purely emotional thinking that have no basis on facts or logic that led to such events as the Capitol riot, with many of their supporters believing that somehow Trump was still going to be inaugurated up until the actual inauguration happened, with many of them holding ludicrous beliefs like it was Trump in a Biden suit at the inauguration, or other ridiculous ideas. But historically look no further than Mussolini, who was seen as an interpreter to the people's will to the fascists in charge, which leads to their disdain for parliamentary democracy. While most would see democracy as a true expression of the people's will, fascists feel only the party leader represents their group and the people, despite the objections to him by people outside the party. Mussolini once said about the Italian parliament, I could have transformed this deaf and gloomy place into a bivouac for my maniples. Meaning that he saw the parliament as having a better use for housing his soldiers, rather than being a true voice of the people. He later got rid of the parliament, leading to the fact that whenever a politician casts doubt on the legitimacy of a parliament, because it no longer represents the voice of the people, we can smell ur fascism. I can't help but make a comparison to the riots of the capital, with the insurrectionists calling to hang and kill the people elected by democratic process, similar to the Nazis dissolving the Reichstag after the fire and them starting to lose sway in the elections. Number 14. Ur Fascism Speaks Newspeak All the Nazi or fascist schoolbooks made use of an impoverished vocabulary and an elementary syntax in order to limit the instruments for complex and critical reasoning. Umberto Eco references Orwell's 1984, a man who just so happened to be a democratic socialist, but also justifiably decried the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, obviously for different reasons. Not that Orwell doesn't have problems of his own. Fascist groups speak in a simplified language, so that they can appeal to the frustrated and uneducated, and give them a simple and clear enemy to point to. It's the Jews that are doing this, we may have no real evidence of this, but trust us, it's them that control the world. 
or that this is part of an agenda by all gay people to turn the world or our group gay. Jewish people and gay people have nothing particularly in common with each other, minus the fact that they are historically oppressed groups that are both Jewish and gay. Now I must say, at the same time, groups like the wealthy elite do have a common interest, and that is to stay wealthy elites. Anyone can be a wealthy elite, black, white, male, female, gay, straight, it doesn't matter. Though it is disproportionately certain groups, they all have a common vested interest, and it's a simple one. They want to maintain their wealth and class, and a group that's whole purpose is to disrupt and tear down this hierarchy and all hierarchies, with the rich on top as a threat to their status quo, so they resort to an uneasy alliance with fascists. Given Umberto Eco's points, let's go ahead and compare them against just a few possible fascist states and leaders, and see where they rank up in order to declare them fascists or not. Now we're not going to go in depth into each one of these groups, but if you want me to make a follow up video on that or anything else, please let me know down in the comments below. Also please remember not all of these points need to align for a state to be seen as a fascist state but just a good chunk of them will give you a fair indication on if the state should be considered as such. Also, we already used some of these states as examples for some of these points, and this is just from my perspective from the facts I've researched. If I missed something or you feel I messed up on a point or two, go ahead and let me know. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start with the birthplace of fascism, Mussolini's Italy. Now, as you can see clearly that of course Mussolini's Italy follows all 14 points of Earth fascism which is to be expected being the origin of fascism. So with that, we can clearly define them as a fascist state. Now let's go ahead and take a look at Hitler's Nazi Germany. I would debatably say Nazism follows many of these points even more so than Mussolini's Italy, which makes it super easy to define Hitler's spin-off branch as definitively fascist. Now that we've talked about some definitive fascist states, let's look at Francoism, which many people will say isn't fascist. And as you can see, it fits almost all of the points, minus the enemy being both strong and weak. Francoism did scapegoat the non-Catholic regions of the nation, along with socialists and communists. But it's kind of murky, because even though he did not say they were inferior to them, he definitely thought they would take over the country and fight a civil war in response to this. Given all this, I would still call Francoism fascist, especially early in his reign with his coalition of traditionalists, phalangists, and carlists, and his closeness with the Axis states. Let's also look at a state not traditionally seen as fascist, but was seen as authoritarian, which is the Soviet Union under Stalin. As we can see, while the Soviet Union did have some elements similar to fascist movements, it disagreed on key points such as modernism, traditionalism, and a contempt for the weak. Also, I would note Stalin was paranoid and had many internal purges, which shows an obsession of an internal plot on himself, but not one of a xenophobic or outside nature. So while I would call the Soviet Union under Stalin very authoritarian and dictatorial, I would not call it fascist. While Mussolini's fascism is of course the original and some would say the only real fascist state, that's a complete oversimplification of its reactionary beliefs. Nazism, Francoism, and plenty of other ideologies are inspired by Mussolini's fascism and built upon it to create their own variants of fascism. Like conservatism, liberalism, and leftist systems, there are many different variants and spin-offs of each base ideology. But they hold the same core beliefs, and in the case of fascism and understanding fascism, it is these 14 points that help explain the overarching ideology of fascism. 